how long would it take someone to change their omega-3 index? Like if they were, if I had never consumed fatty fish, I wasn't taking an omega-3 supplement, nothing like that. And I started today. Is it one of those things like you see a pretty quick increase or is it, as you're mentioning, is sort of a lagging indicator where it's like, okay, take it for three months. Then we have to kind of go back and retroactively measure. But then also as far as a benefit is concerned, like, or risk, like if someone were to have a low omega, omega three profile or index, and they had that for three months, is that potentially equivalent to three months of smoking? How does it equivalent or how is it equivalent in terms of a time scale? Um, well, to address your first question, it takes, I would say about three months, like about three months is a good time range. Like let's say you're now deciding I'm going to increase my omega-3 intake through supplementation, through um, maybe increasing sources of, you know, high um, EPA and DHA, like fatty fish, um, wild Alaskan salmon, you would, you would wait about three months again, because it takes about that long for your red blood cells to turn over. So you have to wait that long before you can get an omega-3 index test done. And, um, you know, the question is, well, omega-3 index, why do you want it to be higher? Well, I mentioned the smoking, right? When I say higher, most of the studies are like 8% omega-3 index or more. And when I say low omega-3 index, most studies are 4% or lower. Um, average omega-3 index in, in the United States is about 4 to 5%. So we're really low. Compare that to Japan, they're like 10 or 11% omega-3 index. The average Japanese person, on average has a five-year increased life expectancy compared to the average American. Now, um, Bill Harris has done some, some research looking at um, huge, pop, you know, huge uh, sample sizes, looking at the omega-3 index and life expectancy. And people that have the 8% omega-3 index or higher have a five-year increased life expectancy compared to people with the low omega-3 index of so 4%. Now, how long does it, you know, how much omega-3 would it take to go from 4% to 8%, right? After today's video, I put a link down below for Element Electrolytes. They are not sweetened with erythritol. Element Electrolytes are 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams magnesium, but that link down below gets you a free sample variety pack with any purchase of Element Electrolytes. So whether you purchase their sparkling, whether you purchase their stick packs, or whatever, you get a free sample variety pack and that's exclusively using my link down below. That is drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Again, drinklement.com slash Thomas. Really interesting stuff. They curb my appetite entirely, but I also have them in a fasted state and I sip on them during my fasted workouts because I feel like I actually get replenished, but I also get my cravings satisfied. So that link is down below in the description. Um, obviously there's individual variation. There's, a, you know, omega-3s are a, you know, compound that it, 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 we make in our bodies from ALA. We also have to get ALA from our diet to make them, but we have a lot of gene variations that regulate the way we metabolize it. With that said, on average, it takes people about two grams of omega-3 a day to go from a 4% to an 8%. And those studies have been done. Um, so whether or not your omega-3 index is low for three months, and then you go up to, you know, from 4% to 4% to 8%, like we don't like, we don't know what effect that has, right? Like you're asking a very complicated question in terms of like, you know, time kinetics and, um, you know, oh, I was low omega-3 during development and through my early adult life. But then I, you know, at some point we then go to randomized controlled trials yeah. and that's where, go, you know, we still, we also have data where it's like, okay, people that are at high risk for, let's say myocardial infarctions or heart attack or people that have existing um, cardiovascular disease, they're taking you know, pharmaceuticals like statins, for example, to treat it. Um, a lot of studies have, have taken these populations of people that presumably um, do not take omega-3. Unfortunately, studies don't often measure the omega-3 index at the start of a trial. I wish they did. They don't. Um, it costs more money, and there's that's like the age-old problem with randomized controlled trials is not measuring measuring nutrient levels in a person before the trial starts. I think it really it's it's one of my 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 pet peeves because um, you know we have different gene variations that regulate the way our body metabolizes nutrients. Right? It's not like a drug. You don't have to measure someone's baseline levels of let's say a statin that you're going to give them at the start of a trial because nobody has statins. Yeah at the start of a trial, but people have 
different, you know, intakes of fish. They have different genes that regulate how much, let's say they take, eat a lot of walnuts or flax seeds, which are high in ALA, um, the plant omega-3 that makes them either convert it well or not well. Like, you know, there's, there's reasons why we need to, to measure these, you know, nutrients at the start of a trial. Anyways, not done, but we do know, for example, there's been um, the reduced trial. That was the big trial that was that looked at um, people with existing cardiovascular disease, and it was a five-year trial where people were given a high dose of purified EPA. So it was just one of the omega threes, and it was in an ethyl ester form, which we can talk about. It's not very bioavailable, and um, or a placebo. In this case, the placebo was mineral oil, and there's all sorts of controversy over. And that being actually pharmacologically active and not being a great placebo. Regardless, um, after the five years, people taking the EPA, it was called, it's called Vizipa. It's a pharmaceutical um, prescriptive form of omega-3 that people are given, for example, with high triglycerides or with existing cardiovascular disease. Um, those people had a 25% decrease in heart attack or de- actually it was death from heart attack and death from heart disease compared to placebo. So that was quite robust. Um, and regardless of all the arguments, well, the placebo was, you know, maybe the placebo was actively harmful. Even if you just look at the baseline risk reduction, it was very significant. So, and it was reducing triglycerides, you know, there was effects independent of looking and comparing to placebo group that were like, wow, this is unbelievable. It's taking, like you were saying, it's taking this unhealthy group of people, giving them simply just a form of omega-3 over the course of several years, and it's like dramatically lowering their risk of dying from a heart attack, which is the number one killer in the United States. So, In, in your opinion, if DHA had been in the mix too, do you think it would have even been more profound? This is a great question, Thomas. Um, so another trial was then underway and began. Um, I don't remember what year it started, but the trial um, ga- gave EPA and DHA to people with existing cardiovascular disease that were on a statin. And um, the form of this omega-3 was in free fatty acid form, which is never given to anyone ever. Um, so for free fatty acids, so typically the fatty acids, the omega, the DHA or EPA are bound to a triglyceride backbone, okay? And that's the way our bodies are best at metabolizing it, okay? It's the most bioavailable. Um, ethyl ester, is um, is essentially when people uh, are purifying the omega three, getting away mercury or PCBs, things that are you know unfortunately found in fish. They 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 um, take it off the triglyceride and they bind it to an ethanol backbone and they run it through this column that purifies it. And it's just cheaper to keep it in this ethyl you know ester backbone form. Um, we still our bodies can metabolize those. They're just not as uh, bioavailable as triglycerides. So, for example, if you are taking an ethyl ester form of omega three, like all the prescription forms are, Leveza, which is DHA and EPA, or Vizipa, both of those are, are ethyl ester. You absolutely must take it with food and preferably with a higher fat meal to absorb it. Like you would not absorb much at all of ethyl ester form of omega three on an empty stomach. Free fatty acids are not bound to anything. And anybody that has a chemistry background um, or even just scientists in general, like knows like free fatty acids act like a detergent. <laughs> They're lysing cells. They're, um, it's kind of like a soap almost in a way. So why, um, I think the reason why that was, that form was chosen because it can be highly bioavailable, but it can also be very irritating because you're giving your gut this like free fatty acid sort of detergent-y kind of form of omega-3. Um, so that trial was ended early because there was basically, it was not shown to have a beneficial effect on <laughs> you know, any of the outcomes. And, and so people, this made the headlines, people go, oh, it must be the DHA because they added DHA to the mix in this one. I personally don't think that's true. There's lots of other data. They weren't as big of trials, like some out of Japan that also showed that you know DHA plus EPA dramatically you know reduces cardiovascular disease risk and also um, heart attack risk. In fact, if you look at the other big trial, Vital, the Vital study, this was a big trial out of jo- Joanne Manson's group that used um, both omega three, vitamin D, those, those either alone or in combination or placebo. Um, and if we just look at the omega three group, 
those people um, had about a 28% reduction in in um, heart attack risk. So that was a secondary outcome. So the primary outcome of a trial is like, okay, we're going to design this trial. We're going to power the trial to get a statistically significant result based on you know this outcome. And the outcome they based it on was all cardiovascular events, not just heart attack, mm. everything, okay? In that case, there was no effect of omega-3 on all, statistically significant, by the way, effect. Um, it did, there was a trend. Yeah. Um, it wasn't statistically significant in reducing every single cardiovascular event, right? But if you then just looked at, in isolation, heart attack risk, it was almost 30% lower <laughs> in the group that was taking the omega-3, which included DHA and EPA versus placebo. <laughs> so again, one of those things were headlines, oh, there's no effect. You know, that's the, that's the headline. Omega-3 has no effect on, on, the, um, on cardiovascular health because of the primary outcome. It just, there's so much nuance when it comes to these randomized controls. De definitely. And then it's like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but even like, as far as the mitochondria is concerned, there's a higher concentration of DHA than EPA. Is that, am I mistaken? No. Um, so, you know, the, it's interesting. That <laughs> I personally think that both DHA and EPA are very important to get from diet. Also, I, I take, personally, I take supplements and I think I think supplements are a great way to in increase your omega-3 index as well. So, you know, these, these omega-3 fatty acids are well known for their quote unquote anti-inflammatory effects. And a lot of that, um, there's a lot of metabolites from DHA and EPA that are different. There's resolvins, these resolve inflammation. And so you're not getting that inflammatory cycle. There's the Marisins, they do something similar. There's the specialized promediating um, mediators, the SPMs. And these are all involved in resolving inflammation and in lowering inflammation. And they're sort of different from EPA and DHA. A lot of these are coming from DHA. Uh, EPA also directly affects inflammation. So it's decreasing the production of prostaglandins, which are inflammatory mediators, leukotrienes, for example. So, so EPA also has a very direct role in inflammation. And that's kind of this anti-inflammatory role of omega-3. Um, however, as you mentioned, you know, DHA accumulates in mitochondria. Um, these are the energy producing organelles inside of our cell, very important for, you know, energy. They're important for aging, important for muscle function, performance, cognition, everything, right? Um, but DHA also accumulates, it's also very, very highly found in all of our cell membranes. So we're talking about in our neurons, you know, in, you know, you know, in cells and our muscle and what DHA is doing in that role is different than it's an anti-inflammatory role. It's, um, it, it's regulating what's called cell membrane fluidity, the way our cells are, you know, sort of malleable and, um, the stiffness of them, the flexibility of them. Why is this important? I mean, it's important for many, many reasons. We could go hours and hours talking about this and I won't, I'll spare you, but just generally speaking, sort of thousand mile high sort of um, overview of it. It's, it's important for transporters and receptors that are embedded in that cell membrane that are transporting nutrients like magnesium into our cells or, you know, glucose into our cells. They're important for receptors, like for example, on neurons, talking about serotonin receptors, dopamine receptors. When you don't have enough DHA, if, if it's deficient, and these a lot of studies have been done in animal studies with this, looking at deficiency of DHA, you're 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 screwing up neurotransmission, um, dopamine, serotonin neurotransmission because the receptor structure and function is changed because of that cell. It's stiffer. It's mm -hmm. stiffer. It's not the right. You know, it doesn't have the right flexibility, and so it affects. Um, so many physiological processes and then glucose transports affected. So you're not getting enough glucose into and across the blood brain barrier because the transporters, and this has been shown in animal studies, the glucose transporters are completely disrupted when there's a DHA deficiency, at least in rodents. So um, it, it's very important. I think DHA is very important for, for that reason. And as we, as we get into maybe talking a little bit more about some of the sort of novel and I would say less well-studied part of omega-3, which is in the muscle. The cardiovascular, I mean, there's, omega-3 is one of the most well-studied nutrients like of all time. I mean, like there's, we, we know so much about it. You know, there's so many people that have researched it over, over the decades. But um, 
I think there's a really important role for DHA. And, and I do think some of this has gotten a little bit lost in the headline, you know, where it's like, oh, the EPA is so important. The EPA is what reduced the heart attack, you know, risk by, um, you know, 25% or the death from a heart attack, I guess, from, by 25%. I mean, that big study, the reduce trial. Yeah, but it's uh, looking at it in practically an echo chamber. I mean, it's not like factoring in, like when we look at, I mean, cardiovascular function, we look at longevity in the first place, like a lot of roads lead back to mitochondria in the first place and read back, lead back to that membrane fluidity and all these things we're talking about. So maybe in isolation, when you look at it like that, you can say, yes, EPA is, is powerful and is important, but it just seems like we're missing this whole piece. Yeah, it's great. So, you, so mitochondria have two membranes and DHAs accumulates in both of those membranes. And those membranes are essential for the health of our mitochondria, for how they're producing energy, um, for how things are like, 99% of all the proteins in the mitochondria are not made in the mitochondria. We have a we have our own mitochondrial genome. We make some mitochondrial proteins, but the majority of them have to be transported into the mitochondria through a whole transport active transport mechanism, which requires a functional membrane and DHA is part of that. And DHA highly does highly um, accumulates in mitochondrial membranes. And so, you know, there's been tons and tons of animal research which is more preclinical stuff looking at, you know, function of mitochondria, what happens when you make a, um, a, an animal deficient in DHA, it's, you know, messes up mitochondrial function. And, you know, mitochondria is very important for the way we age. It's important for our brain function. It's important to produce energy, you know, just steady state energy, but also like during exercise, right? So there's a lot of reasons why DHA are very important. And I think the main thing also is avoiding that deficiency or insufficiency. So as I mentioned, um, you know, one of the top six preventable causes of death, there's other data out there showing that like, it's like 99% of people in the United States have inadequate omega-3 intake. <laughs> 99, it's like, it's so high and like 80% globally or something like that, where, you know, we're not getting, we're not, people are not eating enough fish or they're not supplementing enough with omega-3, like whatever, you know, there's, you know, you, you can find reasons why people don't want to take fish. They might be afraid of the mercury. They might be afraid of contaminants. But I'll tell you this, like there was a huge push like decades ago by OBGYNs for pregnant women to avoid fish because of the contamination in the mercury. And I think that had just rippling effects, negative rippling effects, you know, because omega-3 is so important for brain development. DHA is so important for brain development. And women were just not eating fish and they weren't supplementing. So they were essentially not getting much omega-3 in their diet. Um, there's now been several studies that have come out that have found that the developing fetus, um, which is probably the most sensitive to mercury toxicity, actually benefits even more. And the omega-3 is protective against the mercury toxicity. Um, in fact, there's, there's been studies looking at development. So um, I think it was like one year, you know, cognitive development at one year and seven years or something like that, where they do like, they look at cognitive development over time of the child. And they looked at the mother's omega-3 um, status. And they also looked at a biomarker, which was mercury. The higher the mother's mercury was, the more intelligent or the, the higher their child scored on intelligent tests. Hmm. Now, does that mean mercury is increasing intelligence? No. Mercury was biomarking omega-3 in fish intake, right? So clearly the mercury wasn't harming intelligence at all because, you know, it was, it was higher in the, the mothers that had children with higher intelligent quotient scores and stuff like that. that so, wow, right. That's, um, I mean, it's, it's like we've... I've seen over the last like five years, three years, really like online, this, like, I'm going to call it weird, like a weird resistance to omega threes. I'm not sure where it's coming from. I'm not, I've always kind of been in your camp. I've always been pretty high, high dose, relatively speaking, two to three grams per day. And especially when I was much lower carb, then I would probably go even higher just naturally, just based on what I was consuming. And it's been interesting to see. I, I don't know where it's coming from. And every time I talk about it, there's resistance from the heavy metal side. There's this and that. Um, I just, I'm a little bit mind boggled by it.